a few words about myself. I have PhD in cryptography, um, 15 years in this. Uh, in, I joined blockchain industry in 2013. My first job was in Stellar. I was a cryptographer there. Now I'm a okay, founder of Distributed Lab. We are focused on infrastructure for, um, I would say, financial industry. And our mission is to create financial internet. I think many people, when they say that, okay, we need to bring democratization to this space, to investment, to finance, they mean, subtle, that we should be able to pay with any currency in any asset we want. So when Simon mentioned, okay, dollar was introduced as a utility token for gold and, and oil, that's exactly what people want at the end, to, pay, to freely pay with any instrument they like. So financial internet should allow any accounting system to talk to any other accounting system freely without like borders. And that's what we want to do. So um, many people know me as the most probably anti-utility token person. And uh, I was like anti-ICO guy for a long time and I still is. Um, and the reason why is I believe that it's very easy to build a Ponzi scheme using utility token. So the simple example, just without telling the names, you can substitute the right name when you read about new ICO. What if Apple gives you discount for an iPhone if you pay with an Apple stock? How, like, uh, what, what do you think will happen with the Apple stock price? Because obviously they can sponsor these discounts from the stock market cap appreciation. And uh, you can... Um, there are some ICOs who are doing exactly that, and they even burn in tokens, so they burn in their shares. And um, you can apply the same model for the coffee machine. So every coffee machine can have its own token, and it will make sense, and you will be able to do an ICO, and you will convince your investors that token price always goes up. And that's where this uh, Ponzi scheme begins. And uh, you know, now people are uh, talking about the uh, uh, growth formula for their tokens, etc. That's exactly that. And the issue is that recognizing utility as a security will not help, as in the previous example. It will all, uh, like may make things worse. And I'm an advocate of security tokens, which is like an asset-backed token. So when you digitize your assets. So now I just um, show a few definitions so we are on the same page. Uh, what is tokenization? I believe it's the process of when you transform your accounting system, how you manage your assets. And in this case, all the accounts in your ledgers are managed via cryptographic keys. That's the key difference. Nothing really, like, nothing more. So instead of having centralized databases that are protected by firewalls, ad administrators, like armed guards, uh, you just use cryptography. So Bitcoin showed us an example how you can have a fully open, transparent ledger that everybody has access to, but nobody can break in. So this principle will apply to any asset in the world. Any accounting system in the world eventually, I believe like in 10 to 20 years, no more, will use this principle to track accounts. And the token is nothing more than the ownership right for an asset. So it's just very simple. Like a dollar used to be a token for gold. Or like you can have uh, these tokens for a subway, etc. So it's a representation of an asset. Why do we need to tokenize assets? Basically, uh, like liquidity is one thing that people are talking about, but the key principle is that when your business is tokenized, it means that it's transparent. So it's like turning your company into a public one without really doing an IPO. Because if all the processes are transparent, your investors, your users can see what's going on. You can still maintain uh, security. Uh, nobody can change accounts that don't belong to them, and uh, etc. But it's very beneficial. And the environment for security tokens is completely different from cryptocurrencies or utility tokens. And that's, I think, the common mistake Then when people try to apply the same concept as in Bitcoin to other tokenized assets. Because Bitcoin technically is a um, commodity. And uh, it's a digital commodity. And uh, 
or like a native currency, a new cur a currency of a new virtual state. But you cannot just introduce these currencies to any business. So as I showed in the Apple example, if you do that, you like have some issues. And uh, even mixing everything on the coin market cap is a very bad idea because right now coin market cap assumes like people believe that they are all cryptocurrencies. That's nothing more far from the truth because cryptocurrency is something that was created in a decentralized way, um, issuance, distribution, processing, uh, audit in a decentralized way, and the other tokens that are on the market can be issued in a centralized way, can represent something, can be um, like have some business logic applied. So it's really a bad idea to calculate total market cap right now. And I believe that calculating, like switching from fiat to crypto is also a wrong word because uh, we are doing just the switching of infrastructure, but not the principle of accounting. So if we do, uh, if we tokenize securities or commodities or whatever, they don't change their um, inherent um, structure. They're still security, still a commodity, even though it's accounted in the crypto ledger. But it's still the same thing. So I wouldn't say fiat can be turned into crypto. Yes, um, central banks indeed will create central bank currencies. I was I participated in the creation of uh, this currency in Ukraine, where I'm from, and the central banks stopped doing that because they uh, feared that uh, there wouldn't be liquidity when the crisis comes. So if they just compete with uh, commercial banks, then people will just buy all the central bank currency and send, like commercial banks will go bust. So that's the issue because you, like, you cannot really do credit with central bank currency. So uh, environment is completely different for security tokens. All participants are KYC'd. Um, comparing to real crypto, which is anonymous by definition. Custody is often necessary, and issuer is trusted, but trust is not global, which means that if I'm a warehouse and I issue warehouse receipts, which is very valid use case, if I am a farmer and I bring my uh, like things into this warehouse and I receive this receipt, I trust the warehouse. But somebody else from the other country may not trust it, and it's fine. So the consensus will be local, and everything, everything else will be like completely different. So the challenges and risks are, for like tokenization in general, is that first, digital identity, it's still not there, the global one. Key management is still a big issue. Uh, legal implications of consensus. People still don't know how to uh, process um, issues when people, like parties disagree or have a fork or fork or something else. And the custody, but custody uh, like with physical assets is the same thing as with digital. So if you have something to back up, then it's sold already. So this is, I think it's important because right now when people talk about tokenization and security tokens, they always talk about this part, trading and everything related to trading or integrations to exchanges. But I think that tokenization of businesses is really about a different thing. It's about transforming internal business processes and accounting of assets. And I will show an example uh, how that works. And it's like an iceberg, and this bottom part is very important because without this, this is all fake. It's like, no, fake is just um, empty without this. So in order to transform our world in making a fully digital one, we have to start from the basics. And basics are how do we do accounting of assets and how do we transform internal business processes. That's uh, where the uh, second, like this security comes. That, uh, again, right now Ethereum is the most popular platform to issue tokens, and I think it's a bad idea. Because really you cannot issue real assets that are maintained by somebody or permissionless, I don't say public, permissionless blockchain. Why? Because look, if you have a proof of work or proof of stake consensus and you have to maintain security and protect yourself from double spending attacks, it's impossible. Because look, if let's say Ethereum market cap is 50 billion and it switches to Casper, so it's proof of stake, and now there will be some portion of this Ethereum is committed to stakes, Let's say like um, 
10 billion is enough to do double spending because 10 billion will be like half of the stake. So what if you issue a trillion worth of assets on top of Ethereum and then double spending will be very likely because the cost of double spending will be less than the cost or like the reward from an attack. So it always will be an issue and also because it's fully anonymous. So you will be trusting real assets to anonymous validators who you cannot find, who are not responsible. Because uh, consensus in public blockchains are not, is not final by definition. It always can be rewritten using an alternative chain. And it's fine with the, there is no such rule as, oh, we should not do a fork. No. So this won't work. That's why I say usually that we should use private blockchains for that. And the private blockchains is fine. It's not just uh, some bullshit blockchain. It's like every company in the world right now has its own accounting system. Just think about this. It's own. It controls it fully. You don't use the global accounting system for your business, warehouse, and loyalty system. You, ha you have your own, and there are reasons for that. And other issues are with public blockchain is that security updates, how do you like manage your system, control, forks, through output, and responsibility. But it doesn't mean that we cannot build a global like environment where everybody knows like what's the state of account is. You can. That's what they call financial internet. When all accounting systems are talking to can talk to each other and can check balances in each other using rec reconciliation techniques. So it's possible. I won't talk about this deeply, but that's the main thing. Now I'll show an example what the tokenization means on a simple example of a game. Why game? Because game is a closed economy. There is no import or export. The assets exist only inside. So imagine that any, everybody played games, I think, in their own lives. So you can imagine that the game will be decentralized. So every device will be a server. And uh, it will maintain the ledger of uh, your things and uh, your internal gold inside. And they will talk into each other. It's like a mesh network. We're not far from that. And then creator of a game, instead of selling the uh, software, can say, oh, I'm introducing a small fee in internal currency that's collected every time players exchange things. And this fee will be accumulated on the account of the developer in the same ledger. So it's like a tax, basically. And then there will be an exchange where this internal gold will be traded to dollars. It's already it's a reality for many games already. So that's how the creator will monetize its game. In the um, it's in interest of the creator to increase the GDP of the game and then collect more taxes naturally. But the most in so obviously this uh, internal uh, gold and all the objects will be like tokens. So it's like a commodity token or a, let's say a security token, the ownership right for a certain asset. And what's next? The creator can introduce another token, which will be a fully uh, like a security token, which will pay dividends from the from all the fees collected by the game. So investors will buy this uh, currency, like tokens, in order to get dividends, but players will still use the internal gold to just f to pay for things. Think about this as, as internal uh, as a currency. And every government wants their currency to be stable. There is no government that is trying to play games with the price. And that's exactly what projects, ICO projects are doing. They're playing, they want to push the price up. I think it's a really bad idea. You should, you should push the price of the security token. How? By increasing the GDP. And it means that will, the total tax will, like, um, collections will be increased. So that's how normal economy works. And obviously, it can be uh, decentralized, and there are no servers that developer maintains, uh, and uh, you may not even have a legal entity for that. So that's this example shows how you can transform your business, not just issuing a token on some platform, but how you transform in business and how you can make um, achieve transparency within your business. Because here, obviously, investors can see how the profits are generated. Developer cannot cheat the investors. So it could be fully open source thing, it can be. And um, so 
and like everybody sees what's going on and agrees to pay this small fee because developer uh, like makes an effort to build this game further. This is one interesting thing, I will touch it briefly, that security token by itself can have mm, many like aspects. Ownership, like dividend flow, like cash flow, and governance. And that's where you can introduce um, quite interesting models. Uh, because like when you invest in startups, Obviously, like ownership matters and governments matters and cash flow doesn't exist in a startup from day one, even from year one and year, year three. And um, it's, I would say it could be a showstopper for security to, for equity tokens in the beginning because it won't, they won't pay dividends. No startup will give cash back to investors uh, the first year. So we have to come up with really uh, advanced financial models, but it's not a token economics, it's just real economics. So we, have, we should hire economists, not the blockchain experts, to develop our uh, models. And that's almost last slide. It's more like, some people say, if you try to apply blockchain to centralized uh, businesses, like such as a warehouse, how it's different from uh, like traditional database? And it is different. But the key difference is security, not some magic uh, like benefits. And security translates into auditability, integrity, robustness, non-repudiation, and so forth. And again, robustness tr um, translates in higher uptime and cheaper infrastructure at the end. You can move it between cloud and private, cloud, etc. So all these features are very much necessary in a business, in every business. So that's where the value will come from. Security means reduction of costs. And it means that you can cooperate with other businesses uh, securely. Again, you can create consortiums where nobody can you know, change things without the uh, direct approval. And the last slide. Ranso asked me how can we prevent uh, that somebody will take over 80% of your house using security tokens. Again, because environment is different, it's KYC for asset-backed tokens, it's much easier. In Bitcoin, again, if you transfer Bitcoins to somebody, you cannot really know where it went uh, and um, who owns them now, and you cannot really give them back, get them back. But when, it, when your system is KYC, then every transaction will have its own counterpart. So it means that if I gave you like a piece of house, you should give me money or, you know, something. And if I go to court and say, wait, my house was stolen, somebody stole my tokens, and my tokens went to Alice, then we can ask Alice, did you really buy this house or did you like stole it? First of all, you can see who, who did that. And if Alice doesn't provide you with the cash transaction to my account, then obviously it was a theft. So it's not fully like trustless. Obviously you can apply smart contracts here, this, but in the beginning I believe it would be a hybrid approach when you still have a legal system and the legal system can do enforcement, but the blockchain provides you with full auditability of all transactions. So I advocated for a long time that in business environment, in KYC and for enterprise, it's not the censorship resistant what matters most, but the transparency. And blockchain can bring this transparency right away, and it's, it will save a lot of money on investigations, on uh, you know situations like that. And that's I think that's the value come from. So um, I am done. So probably wonder what I am doing in this space. We create an infrastructure for security tokens, let's say like that, um, or tokenization, uh, full stack infrastructure, and we license that, so we create white label infrastructure. So it has full stack from exchange to key storage solutions. So that's what we do for more than three and a half years, earning money, no ICO, just pure business, and we do it really like proactively. Thanks. I think I don't have time for questions. Yeah.